All right, good morning, North Park Huron. We're glad you can join us today. We're here to celebrate God and, uh, and just come into his house and worship together. We have our in-house radio broadcaster here with bringing out his radio voice. But we are just so excited that you are here joining us. And we have a, probably not a new face, but maybe a new face for hosting. We brought Jeff in, into the, the red couch here, bright red couch. And we're just starting to bring out some faces so you can meet some people who you might see on camera, but may not actually know them. So we are just going to get to know Jeff a little bit today. So why don't you give us the rundown of who Jeff Veenstra is? <laughs> well... Jeff and his wife, Sonia, who you see up quite a bit. She leads all the worship singing and stuff like that. We've been blessed to be a part of leading music in churches for, for many years. We've been part of North Park for close to 10 years now and, uh, and have the blessing to be a part of Huron from the very beginning. They're leading worship and uh, just being able to praise God that way. And uh, it's been a real blessing. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys have definitely been an integral component of North Park Huron for the last three years. So it's been awesome. So I have a random question for you. Okay. And I often like to ask random questions, but this random question is tied directly in with what the sermon is going to touch on today with Kirk. So do you have any dodgeball stories? Dodgeball? I know we all probably have some <laughs> sort of dodgeball story. That's going back a lot of years. I remember back when we used to play dodgeball in school, we had this thing, it was like on the other side of the court, if you got hit with the ball on your side, you had to go across to the other side of the court, and they had what they called a jail at the back there. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time in jail. <laughs> oh, the truth good, comes but... <laughs> out. The criminal in our midst. <laughs> if you have a dodgeball story, we would love to hear it, because I feel like we all played lots of dodgeball. Yeah, I know in you need to throw class. that in the chat. Yes, absolutely throw it in the chat. So we are going to get to Kirk's message in just a moment, but if you do have a dodgeball story, let us know. All right, but first, please join us in some worship as we... Sing some songs of praise to God and just prepare our hearts to hear the message that Kirk is bringing this morning. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. He holds the mountain in his hands and his love reaches to the depths of the earth. The heavens declare his glory. The skies proclaim his beauty. And still, you have redeemed me. You have called me by name. I am yours. Awake, my soul, for your faithfulness endures forever. I will lift my eyes, for you are my help. I will lift my hands to praise you. I will lift my heart, for you are my salvation. I will lift my voice to proclaim all you have done. I will sing, I will dance, I will lift up a shout. I come to worship you.
you ever needed a champion? Just someone to tell you that you had the courage to do whatever it is that you need to do. Maybe it's just get through the day. Maybe it's just to survive another day with your kids um, at home or just to have a good attitude. We just have the promise from Jesus that he will give us everything that we need and he's chosen you and you have everything that you need to be able to survive today, to get through today because he's your champion. so hard to see it took me so long to believe it you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never harm it when we don't deserve it you take the broken
Well, hi there, North Park Huron. It's great to connect with you again. If we haven't connected before, my name is Kirk Earhart, and I'm actually pastor of our Stratford location, and it's a joy to be able to spend this time with you uh, teaching in the Bible. Um, I, if you haven't done this yet, I want to encourage you before we get started to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, right? Here at North Park Huron, there are some great information for you. Uh, it's a site I subscribe to, and there's a great uh, content for you to grow in a faith journey with Jesus. So we want to encourage you to check out this channel and like and subscribe to it. Well, we're in a series that is called Foolproofing Your Life. Sometimes we make foolish decisions and they impact our life. So we want to learn how do we foolproof our life. And by doing that, we're going to be studying the book of Proverbs. Well, I've spent many years of my life as a youth pastor. I love spending time with teenagers, right? There's this beautiful mix of curious and arrogant, uh, of ridiculous and yet awesome, and they have this rapid nature of change that they experience as they move from childhood to adulthood that makes them just, to me, the most exciting people to be around. I love teenagers. Well, being a youth pastor, one of the things that marks that ministry are games, right? We play a ton of games because games and fun build community, and we all know that we remember community far more than we remember lessons. I remember early in my time, and we used to play this game called the KGB Run, which tells you how old it is, and we used to run, drive around town in cars as leaders, chasing down students who were on foot running around the whole city. We used to play this game called Earth Ball, where we would body check an eight-foot round ball that was filled with air, knocking it at each other, knocking students around violently, and often breaking collarbones. We actually would play hours and hours of Mission Impossible, running around in the dark at church or at camp, and uh, complete with theme music going on all the way through it. We even hosted once the Jello Olympics, right, where we played this variety of Jello themed games, including finding out how much Jello you can stick to a person just by throwing it at them. But of all the games that we played, by far and away the most popular was Dodgeball. There's something so attractively violent about the game of dodgeball that most teenagers love to play it. And if you've never played dodgeball, the title's pretty explanatory. You throw balls at each other and you try to dodge and get out of the way. If you get hit, you're out of the game and you, your team wins by hitting everybody on the other team out. Students, especially junior high students, loved the opportunity to throw balls and hit each other. Not only because it's satisfying to beat somebody at, uh, you know, at a contest of one-on-one, -on -one, but also because it was usually a chance to hurt them. As the youth pastor, I have to be truthful here, I got to admit it, I kind of like dodgeball too. Pastoring students is a tough job. You get paid to spend time with teenagers, yeah, but teenagers can be frustrating, unresponsive, and downright disrespectful at times. The very students you're trying to help navigate the, the challenges of adolescence are the same ones who climb up on top of the roof of the church while you're playing a game. I'm looking at you, Josh and Trevor. Well, the opportunity to legally hit a kid in the face with a ball is a, something the youth pastors love. It's like a balm to our soul, and it's a way to remind the kids that who is still in charge. See, dodgeball is a game that some students obsess with. Every week, they go, we want to play dodgeball, we want to play dodgeball. Just like Danny Rojas from the brilliant TV show Ted Lasso, he might say, football is life. Well, so some of my students would say, dodgeball is life. And in a metaphorical sense, it is. See, dodgeball is about seeing the things that are coming at you, that want to attack you, that want to destroy you, and getting out of the way. So we duck and we juke and we jump and we bend ourselves all the way over to get out of the way of that which wants to take us out. And in life, there are situations and dare I say, temptations that may look like fun opportunities, 
but they are actually tools of our enemy designed to take us out. Hold on. Enemy? Who do I mean by an enemy? What enemy am I talking about? In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter writes this. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The devil. Like, really? The devil? We're going to go there? Yes. Yes. Kaiser Soze, right? A character from the movie The Usual Suspects, right? He said uh, this. He said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. But he does. That's the thing. You see, in Christianity, we believe that there is a literal spiritual enemy that we call the devil that is looking to entrap you and cause you to distance yourself from God, rendering you ineffective and spiritually impotent. But you are not impotent and weak. You are a mighty warrior of God who can stand up to the devil. The Apostle Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the enemy, the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And James, Jesus' half-brother, he says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, we're to be people who are spiritually wise enough to see the schemes of the devil and then to dodge them and to get out of the way. In other words, we need to be people who forsake sin, people who avoid temptation, and who pursue what is called holiness and intimacy with Jesus. You see, when Jesus came, he came to save us from two things. The first thing he came to save us for was the penalty of our sin, which is what the New Testament calls hell. But the other thing he came to save us from was the power of sin to hold us and entrap us. But you are now free from the power of sin and have become slaves to God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. That's from the Apostle Paul in Romans. You see, the sin has this ability to entangle us, right? And keep us from moving forward in our lives. Our habits of self-centeredness and our pursuit of pleasure and of comfort can keep us from knowing God more intimately and moving forward in our spiritual journey. It says in 1 John, the Apostle John writes this, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, we, and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we've got fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And see, when we walk according to God's ways and we turn away from our sin, our intimacy with God gets deeper and deeper. But when we indulge those desires for sin, when we allow the temptations that our enemy throws at us to hit us, we can become useless in the kingdom of heaven. See, you were lovingly created by God, but you were also created with purpose. You were created with purpose. God made you uniquely, and he placed you specially right where you are, in your community, in your job, in your family, so that you might represent him to those who are in your spheres of influence. And by doing so, you would partner with God and draw people into a loving relationship with Jesus. Choosing to turn your back on God and indulging sin, that's foolishness. So for the sake of your faith journey, of your intimacy with God, and for the sake of your testimony of God's saving power, your witness, your ministry that God has called you to, right? Then I want to share with you from the book of Proverbs 
Three tips today to help you avoid sin and foolproof your life. The first one is this. Be careful of traps. In my place, we live in an old um, farmhouse out in the country, 15 minutes but north of the city of Stratford. And uh, one day, I'm sitting on the couch, right, I'm watching TV, doing my thing, and all of a sudden, I hear this blood-curling scream from the kitchen. And I bolted off the couch as fast as I could. I come around the corner to see what the problem is, and I see my wife wide-eyed with a look of fear in her face that I have never seen before. And I found out why. She found a mouse in the house. I've never seen her so freaked out as the day she saw this tiny little bundle of fur scurry across the counter, right? So what do we do? We put out traps for them. That's what you do with mice, right? And in order to entice the mice to come to the trap, we put a generous helping of Nutella on them. And it worked. We caught the mouse, and then my wife was able to sleep more securely. You see, in life, we have to be wary of traps, the mouse should have been wary and scared of the Nutella on the trap. We have to be careful of something that looks good, but in the end will destroy us. See, one of the temptations that we're warned about in the book of Proverbs is sexual sin. The voice of Proverbs, uh, whoever that is, speaking to his son, warns him of the temptations offered by an adulterous woman. Her words sound like honey, and her speech is smoother than oil, he says. But in the end, she's bitter as gall, and she leads him to death. So the author of Proverbs gives this advice for dealing with temptation. In Proverbs 5.8, he says, Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. What is he saying? He's saying, stay away Avoid the spaces where the temptation is, right? Just avoid it. Stay away. Go around it, right? Don't go near the temptation. Avoid it. See, too many people try to get as close as they can to sin. Um, you know, as a youth pastor, we talk about sex with students a lot. And uh, the question that often would come to me is, Pastor, how far is too far with my boyfriend or my girlfriend? And it's a fine question in junior high or even maybe high school, but it's actually the wrong question. Because it's the wrong question because it actually asks, how far can I get from God's will and still get away with it? How far can I go against what God wants and do what I want and still be okay with him? That's what he's asking. But if we were to uh, flip the script a little bit and do what Andy Stanley suggests in his book, Irresistible, and we would ask ourselves the question, what does love require of me in this situation? And it would guide us into ruthlessly avoiding the traps and snares that would lead us away from God, away from our devotion and our love for him, and, Eve, and towards self-centeredness. 19th century tr preacher Charles Spurgeon, when he was talking about temptation, said, well, what settings are you in when you fall? Avoid them. What props do you have that support your sin? Eliminate them. What people are you usually with? Avoid them. There are two equally damning lies Satan wants us to believe. Spurgeon says. One is just once won't hurt. That's a lie that Satan wants us to believe. Number two, now that you've ruined your life with this sin, you're beyond God's use. You're, you're done now forever, so you might as well keep on enjoy sinning. Learn to say no, Spurgeon says. It will be of more use to you than you being able to read Latin. Okay, we don't study Latin much anymore, but hopefully you get the gist. It's more important, it'd be more use of you to say no than to get a college degree. You'll actually do better if you learn to say no. Looking at things, people, and places in your life where you experience more temptation to sin and are making some changes in those areas will help you enjoy a deeper intimacy with God and free you from feelings of guilt and shame 
that giving in to temptation burdens us with. If pornography is an issue for you, don't be alone in a room with an internet access. Move the computer to the family room where other people are. If certain friends always seem to drag you into situations that you know you shouldn't be in, it's time to drop those friends and get with a better crowd. If debt is one of your issues and you got some problems with spending, maybe switch to cash and leave the credit card at home instead of your wallet where you're going to be tempted to use it. But these are just examples, right? You need to do a self-analysis and you need to determine what things do you do that are not an expression of love towards God and what things people or traps, or places, I should say, are traps. What things, people, or places are traps. When you figure those out, then you can work out what steps you need to take in order to keep a path far from that which tempts you. So the first thing is, is that you need to be careful of traps. The second thing is, is be content with what you have. Have you heard the phrase, the grass is always greener on the other side? You see, I read a story this week about a woman who kept looking over her fence to her neighbor's yard, and to her dissatisfaction, her neighbor's yard was always greener, lusher, more healthy. And uh, so being on friendly terms with that neighbor, one day she goes over the fence, she goes around, and looks at the yard. And when she gets there, it looks different than it did before. And when she looks back over the fence to her own yard, her own yard looked greener, healthier, and far more rich. Well, the woman wrote into a columnist and asked why this was. The grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, the columnist says, because you're not close enough to see the dirt. You see, most of us think that other people's lives look better because we can't see the dirt that is there. We can't see the mess in their lives. We look at other people's homes and we're jealous of their perceived wealth. We look at other people's relationships and we wish we had what they have. We look at other people's jobs and desire to have their influence at work. But the problem is we're not seeing the dirt. We're not seeing the mess that those things bring. We don't know if the person with the big house is actually happy. We can't see the fighting and the arguing in the couple's relationship that happens behind closed doors. We don't see the complaints, the conflicts, or the responsibilities that come with the greater influence that the person has to deal with. You see, we look at other people's lives like it's the Instagram story, the snapshot uh, of them in vaca on vacation in paradise with no problems. But that's not reality. It's fantasy. And too many people, discontent with what they have, pursue that fantasy, even if it leads them to sin. Pastor and author uh, John Piper once said, sin gets its power by persuading me to believe that I will be more happy if I follow it. The power of all temptation is the prospect that it will make me happier. So how do we deal with this temptation to pursue um, things that we don't have in order to make us happy? By learning contentment. Still talking about the concept of adultery and sexual sin, which is a big issue in the book of uh, Proverbs. Uh, the author of Proverbs challenges us to drink water from your own cistern, right? Running water from your own well. What's his point? Don't go looking for satisfaction elsewhere. Be satisfied where you are. Are you unhappy in your marriage? Well, then work and make your marriage better. Don't go looking at other women or looking at other men to satisfy you. Unhappy in your job? Before you look elsewhere at other jobs, look at yourself inwardly and figure out why you're unhappy. And is a different job the solution or do you actually have to make an attitude adjustment and find contentment where you are? The Apostle Paul 
Throughout his life, his fortunes seemed to change up and down. He was a well-respected legal genius when he was younger. He was on track to lead the entire Jewish religious council. He, but he gave all that up on the day that he met Jesus. And on that day, everything changed for him. As an apostle called by God to plant churches and reach new people for Jesus, he experienced seasons where his life and his ministry were going really well, right? It was a good time. And there's other seasons where people tried to kill him by hitting him and stoning him to death with rocks. There were times when soldiers would flog him over and over again, 39 times, it hit him with a leather whip that had bits of glass, bone, and metal tied into it. That happened to him multiple times. He had times where he was amply supplied by churches, and he had lots of food and drink and money, and other times when he was nearly starving to death. In the latter part of his life, he was under house arrest in Rome, and at his own cost, he had to rent a place to live he had to pay for his own food and drink, and he, all while he was under constant guard by Roman soldiers. Can you imagine you actually had to pay to be in jail and pay for all the food and drink you have? But you're in jail, so you can't go make money. So Paul was dependent on the kindness of the churches. And while he's there, the church in Philippi started sending him money for his needs. And in his letter to them, which is what we call Philippians, he thanks them for this gift, and he says this, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I learned this secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. You see, Paul learned the secret to contentment, and we should as well. The author of Hebrews says, Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. Because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The temptation for more or for better than what we have leads many people to sin against God and compromise their integrity. So let's be people who choose contentment, who drink from our own cisterns, and so honor God. So tip number one for avoiding sin is to be careful of traps. Tip number two is to be content with what you have. And tip number three is to be aware of the presence of God. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21 says this, For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and He examines all your paths. Now, did you know, this is important information, church, did you know it's only 132 days until Christmas? For some of you, it's time to start shopping, and you know it, right? It's only 132 days till Christmas. My family and I, we love Christmas time, right? We love giving each other gifts. We enjoy decorating the house and we revel in worshiping the coming of Jesus, our Emmanuel, which means God with us. But I got one problem with Christmas, and it's Santa. No, it's not the idea that there's a person or a creature who delivers gifts to children. It's not the part I have a problem with, although I've got some issue with some of the physics, but that's fine. It's the idea that Santa only gives gifts to good children. Like, who is he to determine what is right and wrong for every child in the world? And who determines who's been naughty or nice? And in particular, I also find the idea and this is the part I want to hone in on, that he's always watching you to see if you're good or bad, I did find that really super creepy. Like, I wonder if some people think the same thing about God, though, right? I have to admit I've had those thoughts at times, right? The idea of God always watching me because that feels really creepy. But when I think about it more, and I looked at what the Bible actually teaches around that, I realized that there's a difference between God and Santa, 
right? Um, because if Santa is trying to judge me if I'm good enough to receive his toys that he's going to give me. But God loves me even though we both know I'm not good enough. He sent Jesus to die for me, for my sins, for my mistakes, for my problems, for my failures. He didn't send Jesus to die because of how good I am, but because of how good he is. I see that God is love, God is just. And that as a follower of Jesus, there is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Jesus doesn't condemn me because he has saved me. God is watching, but he's not watching from a distance like Santa watching from the North Pole, judging people if they're going to be good or bad. No, God is present with each of us all the time. We call the idea of it, the theology around it, called omnipresent. Psalm 139 says this, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You see, God is with us all the time. Often when temptation comes for us, there's this voice in our head that says, it's okay, go ahead, no one will know. No one is watching. No one is here. But it's not true. The Lord knows because he's with you and he loves you. If we were to remember the presence of God in our everyday lives, when we're at work, when we're driving in the car, when we're bi riding our bike, when we're home alone, then we might be filled with the strength to overcome temptations. The Apostle Paul says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. See, because God is with us, there's no temptation that's too powerful for us. Right? We can overcome all things because we're not alone in the battle. Right? We have this omnipresent king of kings standing with us. We've got Jesus who himself was tempted and yet overcame all of his temptations on our side, helping us. And when we forget that truth, it's easy to let the temptations that we face, whether they be lust or fear or uh, apathy or busyness, to overtake us. But when we remember this truth, that God is with us, we can become infinitely powerful and overcome any temptation. For many people, the point of life is to do what feels good or what feels right. I believe this way of thinking leads to momentary pleasures, but spiritual death. I believe that the point of life is to walk in intimacy with God, to follow Jesus, to be led by the Holy Spirit. To do that, we need to see the temptation that our enemy, all the temptations that our enemy throws at us and dodge them out of the way. After all, dodgeball is life. Would you pray with me? God, you are so good. You're so good to be with us in this world where we got temptations coming at us, where we got an enemy who's trying to take us down, but you are on our side. And with you on our side, we cannot lose. If you are for us, then who could be against us? Who can stand before you, the mighty God? No one. And you're on our side. You're on our team because if you love us deeply. So Lord Jesus, would you give us a heart to want to obey you deeper? Would you give us a heart to want to walk in greater holiness and greater um, intimacy with you? Would you give us a, um, a wisdom to foolproof our life and move out of the way of the temptations that our enemy is going to throw at us? Would you help us, God, to be in all things giving you the glory 
and walking for you, living for you. God, you're good. We love you. We thank you. We pray you would continue to reveal your great love to us. In the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen and amen. So that now is our third week of Foolproofing Your Life in the book of Proverbs. And Kirk really uh, hit some key points this week talking about avoiding temptation, which is a pretty big topic. And so he had three points, which we're just going to recap really quickly. And the first one was, be careful of the snares or things that can trigger you. Be content with what you have and be aware of the presence of God. If there's one of those three things that really captivated you or captured you or challenged you in any way, we'd love for you to put it in the chat, and Jeff and I are going to share which one stood out for us the most. So do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. I think one that really stands out for me is always being aware of the presence of God. Uh, I find a lot of times it's easy when you're going through your week, you get caught up in other things and not even thinking that God's around you, that God's not there. He's not always present because you're focused on doing your thing mm -hmm. and i think it's it's good to always be aware that god's i won't say god's watching but god's always present mm -hmm. he's always with you and you're not doing things alone you don't have to be doing things alone it's it's trusting that that god's gonna be there for you and he's not watching you to make sure that you're doing well he's watching you to make sure that he can be there for you mm -hmm. and and so we know that he loves us that he's always present for us and and i think that that's really important for us to recognize as, as we go through our weeks because sometimes it gets so busy that we lose sight of that and, and just trusting that he's always there and that he's always watching us and always looking out for us mm -hmm. can be a real comfort. Yeah, it is really a comfort because then when we get into these spots where we need wisdom, it's like, oh, he's right there, ready yeah, to go. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I also like the point about being content with what you have. Uh, I know that especially in this last year and a half, I know that for myself, I've struggled with the but I don't have what I used to have and I don't have what I want to have yeah. and wrestling with that. But I know that um, when I was able to posture myself with the attitude of gratitude, those were just transforming moments and uh, reminded me that, you know, God is the one in control just and God's... Take that step back and yeah. just be still and just... Yeah, but without it, you can get so caught up with the, the me-centeredness and mm -hmm. what you want and you forget about other people around you. So. For sure. Definitely some challenging things to consider. If you haven't uh, mentioned maybe in the chat or to someone around you one thing that's challenged you, we would love for you to consider it. It's really great to take these things that we talk about on Sundays and really figure out what, what is the challenge for me or what's the encouragement for me and how do we apply that in our everyday life. So uh, I'm just going to pray for us and then we'll close off our service. So God, we just thank you for Pastor Kirk and just the, the words that you have given him to teach us um, through the book of Proverbs. Um, God, sometimes it's, it's hard with wisdom and know what the wise thing is to do. And I just pray for anybody uh, today who has to make a wise decision but is struggling to know um, what direction to take or struggling to know what you want from them or of them uh, or for them to do. Uh, may you just make your presence known to them and make it clear uh, where... Um, you would like them to go or what you'd like them to do or what kind of maybe attitudes or perspectives that you want to change. And for anybody facing any sort of temptation, God, may that just become an awareness so that we can um, move in the opposite direction, God, so that we can be more in line with who you are. So we just commit all of our community to you and just thank you for how you are working and moving in all of our lives. Amen. Amen. Well, I think that wraps up a regular service. Uh, but I invite you to stay around because for about 10 minutes we're going to keep the chat window open just to say hi to friends, maybe talk about plans for the day or plans for the week, special things that are coming up, things that are exciting. Just feel free to share that. So mm -hmm. please hang around for the next 10 minutes and uh, chat away. And Absolutely. I hope everybody has a blessed week and uh, we'll see you next week.